Okay, guys. So um, uh, there's a few issues here that I've listed. Um, resolution, repeatability, maximum cable length, issues with connections, single mode versus multi-mode, power consumptions of systems, reference baths and freezers, cable construction in terms of buffering and splicing. And these are some of the things that um, are really important pieces. And um, which I really, uh, I think that everyone needs to understand uh, it to, to be able to do this properly. So let's work through these if you don't mind um, real quickly. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is resolution. So um, what we have is we have this fiber optic cable and we're gonna put a burst of light down it. And the light actually has a temporal uh, dimension. And that temporal dimension, once it's launched into the fiber, means it also has a spatial dimension, okay? And so we've launched that at what we thought was time zero, but in fact, we launched it starting at time zero and it extended for a period of time. And so it's a fundamental size of that device, of that, of that, of that pulse of light. And as that pulse of light goes down the fiber, it disperses. And so its length scale, its resolution actually changes. And so there is dispersion. And it's of the order of 30 centimeters per kilometer-ish, okay? It's a rough and ready number. And dispersion, as you know, goes to the square root of the distance. And so really it should be 30 centimeters per square root of kilometer probably. But anyway, um, basically your pulse of light is going to get wider. Now that's different than what we call the sampling interval. So you will see that many DTSs sample at something, um, the sampling interval is often much shorter and adjustable by the user. But keeping in mind, so, so a very common thing is to set the sampling say to 12.5 centimeters. Whereas the pulse of light uh, may have a width of, of 45 centimeters. And so what we see is that if we look at our reported data, be very careful that just because you have a sample every so many centimeters does not mean that those data are, are actually independent measurements. So this measured value is not independent of that because it was interrogated by, it was the, the photons coming back were averaged um, without distinction between those two locations. Okay, so we have this idea of resolution, which is that we have the fundamental resolution of, of, the, um, of the light pulse. And then we have the sampling resolution. And so please um, keep those separate. Now, I, I, it was a, a interesting study where um, someone actually took a cable and dunked a chunk of that cable into an ice bath. And what they did is they, let's suppose this is the ice bath. What they did is they only had this much of the cable in the water. Now, if that much of the cable, so they happened to use a two meter resolution device. So what happens is if you have a piece of cable, if your true resolution is like this, and you have a, a piece of cable here that you've exposed to a, a particular temperature, what it's gonna do is it's gonna under report because it's averaging in all of the temperature here and here into that measurement. And so in this published report, uh, they reported that, gee, this instrument doesn't work because look, it under reports the temperature. But that's because they were fundamentally not um, respecting the fact that the spatial resolution of the system was, was much larger than the, than the resolution they were, they were seeking to resolve in their, in their little study. So please, first and foremost, understand that each instrument has its own resolution. At sea temps, we have our best instrument for temperature has a fundamental uh, resolution of about 29 centimeters, and it reports every 12.5 centimeters. And so that this is kind of trying to respect the basic rules of, of um, uh, of data analysis where you have to report twice as often as your basic uh, uh, wavelength. And so um, in that sense, reporting about two times the, the frequency, the, the, the spatial resolution of the overarching arching resolution is still valid. 
but watch out. There are many instruments which will take you down to one centimeter spatial resolution or 12 centimeters of resolution when their actual resolution is two meters. And that can lead to some very, very poor outcomes if you think that those are, are actual resolution. Are there any questions about this idea of spatial resolution? Okay. The next thing I wanna talk about is repeatability. So, so when we look at the accuracy of a measurement, what we'll do is we'll take a fiber optic cable, we'll identify one location and we'll report its value in time. So we'll let temperature on this axis and time on that axis. And we'll see that it reports with some noise. So the repeatability is gonna be reported as a standard deviation about the true value. And so it's gonna be one standard deviation about the mean. So in other words, if we say that the repeatability is 0.01 degrees C, that means that about a third of your data is going to be more than a hundredth of a degree away from that. And that's just taking the exact same uh, point of the cable and, repeat, and, and, and recording it uh, repeatedly, okay? So that's repeatability. Um, maximum cable length is something that I really think is important for you to understand. The, the deal is that our system, we have a cable sitting here and we're gonna launch a pulse of light, okay, at time T zero. And that pulse of light is gonna transport down the fiber and then it's gonna back, it's gonna reflect back. And each time along the way, of course, it's sending back our little, our friendly little Raman backscatter. So there's always Raman backscatter for me, okay? Now the deal is if this cable is too long, then what's going to happen at T2 or T1, we can say, we're going to launch another, another pulse. But the problem is that photons are going to be coming back because this pulse will continue down the fiber and photons will still be coming back from our previous pulse. But we're going to interpret them as if they came back. So this, let's say this is our instrument length. So in other words, this is, a, let's say, a two kilometer instrument. And by being a two kilometer instrument, that means it's gonna put out a new pulse thinking that the last pulse just reached the end of the fiber two kilometers away. And so I can put out another pulse. But if I have four kilometers of fiber on there, I'm gonna put out a second pulse while photons from the first pulse are still coming back. So it's a very important point that we have to have a match between the repetition rate of the instrument and the fiber length you're using. Okay, so at C temps, we have uh, certain instruments which you can adjust the, the expected fiber length. The advantage of having an instrument that's designed for, for short cable lengths is that it can repeat more frequently. So it can average more photons. And so our highest performance machines are often two kilometer or even shorter uh, cable length restricted. If you put a three kilometer cable on a two kilometer machine, you're gonna have trouble. Does that make sense to everybody? So watch out. This idea of adjustable lengths is really a big deal. What's the maximum length that you can go to with a, 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 a multi-mode fiber optic uh, machine? Question for the audience. Uh, Christine, Maria, any ideas? Uh, 10 kilometers? It turns out that, um, that AP Sensing um, just uh, wrote a scientific article showing they can go to 75 kilometers with a multi-mode fiber. And this is, so the, what's that mean? If you go to 75 kilometers, you are putting in very few pulses of light. So we immediately know, there's no getting around physics. We immediately know that they're gonna have fewer photons. And so you're gonna have to average over a longer period of time. Now, when Scott put all those equations up, what he didn't tell you is that actually the typical DTS is putting out pulses about 50,000 per second. And so it's actually taking that ratio over and over and over again in time, okay? And so by having a longer cable, a 75 kilometer cable, that means we're gonna have 75 times fewer pulses than we would with a one kilometer cable. And so we're gonna intrinsically have fewer photons in our calculation, which means we're gonna have more noise. Now, when you're setting up your DTS, 
you often want to think about, well, how long do I want to average in time? So the, the thing is, you can set your DTS to report back every second. In the case of our, of our Celixa Ultima machines, we can report back every second a temperature reading. But of course, if it shot out 50,000 pulses, we have 50,000 uh, measurements that went into that averaging, right? Or we can average over a minute. And then we have 60 seconds times 50,000. It sounds like 3 million pulses. And that gives us a much lower um, noise level on our signal, OK? And so our repeatability is going to be much better. The thing is that we can always post facto average our data. So in other words, let's say you took data, you set your data to take data once every second. After the fact, you're gonna have a lot of files, okay, every second, so you have 80,000 files a day. That's a kind of a pain, but anyway, we've done it before. After the fact, we can average all those. And so we, we wanna, you know, so the, 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 the rule of thumb is that data storage is pretty cheap. And so you would do better to make sure you take data with the highest possible frequency that you ever will need. So if you're looking at a river system and you say, you know, we might have a, 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 a dam that opens and closes um, every couple of hours. Well, then you certainly wouldn't want to average over hours. You'd want to be taking data probably at a 15 minute level or so. If you have a cable underground, like Christine was talking about at a cranberry bog, things change very slowly underground. But on the other hand, if you have a cable that's in the air, it might be something you need to read very frequently. So this time averaging, the point is that yes, the noise goes down, but you, can, you don't lose anything by post-processing and averaging later. So always set your time averaging to the lowest possible value of interest. Does that make sense? Okay, so that has to do with maximum cable length and, and averaging time. Now, connectors, we use an industry standard as an E2000 connector. And the E2000 connector, you need to get an angle polished connector. So that's an APC. Now, when you ask for an APC E2000 with multi-mode fiber, they're going to say, what crazy farm are you calling from? This is not something we do. We don't do APC multi-modes. And you say, yeah, that's right. There's a custom job. So the deal is the end of the fiber is polished at, with an angle cut so that any stray photon that gets the angle fiber will be bounced out instead of doing a direct backscatter will be bounced out of the fiber. And this is very important. Um, and, and the thing is that this angle is then oriented within our E2000. So when the next fiber comes along, it's going to match up to that angle. And then the, pho the photons will cross across this, um, the, that connection. Now, clearly, anytime we have a junction, a mechanical junction between two pieces of glass with the potential for an air gap between them, we have a lot of possibilities for screw ups. You could have, um, you know, you're going to have an index of refraction change from glass to air to glass. And every time you have an index of refraction change, there's a partial backscatter. So you're going to lose energy. You're going to lose photons. But not only that, you're going to lose different numbers of photons for different colors of light. Meaning what Scott was talking about earlier, this idea that we have this two frequencies of light we care about. One's a Stokes, one's the anti-Stokes. They're different. And so at every junction like that, you might lose a different fraction of each of those colors of light, which means that there'll be a temperature offset. When you go to calculate your ratios, you've lost a different fraction of your, of your key photons. And so you'll have a temperature error at this junction. Furthermore, this is typically encased in a plastic, a green plastic housing. So this whole thing sits in a green plastic housing. Now, what do we know about plastic? Plastic expands and contracts with temperature a lot. It's very temperature sensitive. And so the problem is that this plastic housing expands and contracts as temperature changes. Now, what does that mean? That means that the very variable that we care about, temperature, is influencing the error that we experience across this junction. So the bottom line is that we want to put a big X through that. And we want to say, we do not want E2000s wherever possible. The sad truth is that all of our instruments have little holes which only accept an E2000. So we're always going to have at least one E2000 on our fibers. 
but you want to avoid them whenever possible. And what you want to do is use this, which is uh, splicing. And fusion splicing is where you literally take two pieces of fiber and you put a plasma arc across them and that melts the fiber and the capillary forces then turn a flat face into a rounded face. They bump into each other and then they, they merge. And so there's this very cool way of merging two fibers, having the glass physically merge and it keeps the organizational structure of the glass intact. So the core glass is touching core glass and the cladding glass is touching cladding glass. And so the light slips through as if nothing happened in an ideal world. Here in New Orleans, we definitely understand it's not an ideal world. There's potholes. So when you walk around New Orleans, you have to keep your eyes open. And similarly, when you're doing DTS work, you have to keep your eyes open. And the deal is what I want to talk about here really briefly is what we call asymmetrical losses. So the deal is that when you bring these two pieces of fiber together, if one of them is offset with respect to the arc, the plasma arc, it will preferentially melt. So let me see if I can blow this up a little bit. There we are. So what happened here is this blue guy preferentially melted and it became smaller. And the other guy here didn't melt very much and it stayed larger. And what that means is that these photons coming down this fiber are gonna escape and so only a few of the photons are gonna actually get into the blue fiber in this case. On the other hand, if you're a photon coming from the blue fiber, everybody gets in, okay? Because the core actually focuses to the core of the other glass. And this is what we call an asymmetrical loss. Now you can imagine this is just a nightmare because this asymmetrical loss, by the way, will be light frequency dependent. And so you're gonna, again, have a temperature defect here. But the worst thing is that some of these red guys are going to end up in the cladding. That is the outside part of this cable. And those will only die off over many meters, like say a couple hundred meters. And they will create backscattered photons that will give unexpected um, photons amplifying the temperature sensitivity at that very location. So what you'll end up with is kind of what we call a whale shaped defect where the, um, the temperature, there'll be an error right at that joint and it'll carry on for about um, 200 meters as a whale shaped defect in the temperature data. So, okay, I just want you to be aware. And, and one of the things that CTEMPS is really about is that people, uh, when we first did this work, uh, Scott and I, when we were uh, had more hair and, and were uh, a little more nimble, um, we, we got very lucky and did a lot of work that worked out very nicely. And then um, we later learned there's a lot of pitfalls out there. And our job is to avoid these sorts of pitfalls for you. And so this is why we want to go through these pitfalls and make sure that you're aware that, oh my gosh, this, is, this could happen to me. It absolutely could. I want to talk very briefly also about this idea of single mode versus multi-mode fiber. So we use multi-mode fiber in Raman DTS because it has a very large aperture. And we are pumping, we, the instrument is pumping a tremendous number of photons down there. If you take a piece of black electrical tape and you put it on the end of a fiber that's hooked up to it, it'll smoke. You will literally burn the, um, the, 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 the tape. So we like multi-mode because it's a big section. We can put a lot of photons down there. The bad news is it allows lots of photons to go in different paths, which means there's a lot of dispersion. And also at these frequencies, there's a lot more loss of light. That loss of light is our friend. That is what creates Raman backscatter. So in a sense, multimode is ideal. We can put a lot of light down. We get a lot of backscatter. We get a lot of data from which we can calculate our temperature. On the other hand, single mode fiber allows for much longer communication. So there are devices that use single mode. Now there's a different physics that Scott alluded to called Brion backscatter. And so many of the single mode machines will use Brion um, because it's more suited to, to the single mode fiber. There's another new machine, well, relatively new by Nubrex that uses Rayleigh backscatter, which gives extreme, uh, extremely high performance. So even though we are normally gonna use multi-mode, there are machines which can read all uh, either multi-mode or single mode. Okay. And um, the last thing I'm gonna mention is cable construction. Uh, and we can talk about these other things later, but cable construction is really one of the critical pieces. When you put in an experiment, your data is only 
as good as the cable was appropriate to your site. So thinking, for example, um, about deep well installations. If you, do, if you have a cable that's exposed to that pressure, that's gonna cause attenuation. And so you have to protect the fiber from that uh, impinging pressure, for example. Any cable, if you have a tensile strength, a tensile stress on it, then that can give rise to um, losses due to tensile stress. Also, in fact, if the cable is overfilled with fiber, it can give compressive losses of, of, of um, light. So the cable construction, you should be thinking about what are my pressures? What are my tensile strengths? Um, and how much bending will go on in that fiber? We have tricks to uh, accommodate each of those situations, but fundamentally um, selecting the right cable is, 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 is essential to be able to get good data. The CTEMPS facilities keep cable on hand. So we have many, many kilometers of all these different cables because the lead time on cables is often significant. And so when you're planning your experiment, think of 12 week units. So, you know, basically to get yourself a cable, figure it's gonna be 12 weeks. To get yourself a machine, it's gonna be some time. So we have to have a lot of lead time. One of the things CTEMPS can do for you is reduce that lead time because we've bought the stuff internally and we can then ship it out immediately. And so we've been able to help a lot of people who have a, 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 a sudden need, either their cable failed or they decide to add DTS at the last minute, whatever the case may be, that's why we keep a lot of cable on stock. Okay, with that, um, I'm just gonna uh, take a, a pause and we're gonna get ready to move over. Um, uh, so we have a question and answer period that if we have a, a, a few questions or answers about this, uh, these last few concepts. So any questions out there? I have one, please. Yes, please, Marie. Uh, about these asymmetric uh, issues when splicing, is it something that we can control or see at least when we uh, splice the cables in directly on our small uh, screen? Of the, no. No, no, you really, unfortunately, you really have to watch out. There's two types of splicing machines. There's what's called core alignment splicers, where they actually take the fiber and they move it up and down and sideways until they get them just aligned. Yeah. And, th and that's very important for single mode. Well, it used to be essential for all fibers because it used to be that the, the core of the fiber was not necessarily in the middle of the fiber. So they had to actually look where the core actually was and get the cores aligned. And so they made core alignment uh, tools. And th the thing is, when a splicing machine reports its loss across the splice, Mm -hmm. The fixed V machines, that's where you drop your fiber into a V and, it just, and cross your fingers. The fixed V machines, where they can't move the fiber around, um, only report based on what they took a picture of before they spliced. And so when you see a 0% attenuation, that has no meaning. There's no measurement behind that. It's just that they looked at it, they said, look good to us, it must be good. On the other hand, core alignment machines have the ability to inject light into the fiber and they measure the light coming out the other side. So core alignment machines often have an actual measurement of the attenuation, but still mm -hmm. they won't detect asymm asymmetries. They don't do bi-directional. And so the key thing with, with this asymmetrical fusion is do not take the maintenance of that fusion splicer for granted. So those little pins that do the arc, they have to be replaced. And, the, and the, uh, the cleaver, super important, your cleaver has to be done right. And the motors that bring the cable to and from, the, if they are not absolutely symmetrical, that's a problem. So we send our, our machines back for recalibration periodically. And if you're using any sort of uh, fusion splicer, keep track of it, don't drop it because that's gonna get it out of alignment and you will end up with this asymmetrical um, problem. So it, unfortunately, this is super hard to detect. The only way we know, I know to detect it is actually hooking up a DTS and shining light from both sides. Uh, otherwise, it's it, on an OTDR, for example, an optical time domain reflectometry measurement, very hard to see. So, it's, so one of the things that, again, I wanted to say about DTS versus all other telecommunication applications of fiber we are about a hundredfold more sensitive to these sort of defects than any other application of fiber optics. So all of the basic tools for fiber optics are not good enough for us. So the, the OTDR will say, oh, that's great. That's a great, a great splice. The fusion splicer, oh, that's fantastic. And it turns out it's lousy for us. So watch out, we are pushing fiber optics beyond where the telecom people ever live. And so what's fine for them doesn't work at all for us. And that's a very common situation.